Right, time now for the exchange. Let's bring in Michael Bosicu. He's a Global Affairs Analyst and Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council. He's joining us from Canada. Welcome, Michael. So let's think back to where we were at the beginning of 2023 when you had Ukraine really promising this sort of spectacular counteroffensive. They promised that they were going to sort of claim back Ukrainian territory that was occupied by Russia. And you think to where we are now. I mean, the gains by Ukraine have certainly been modest. I think that's even putting that generously. Um, where did it all go so wrong for Ukraine? And how does Zelensky get things back on track? Sure. And good to be with you. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, the, the shock and awe of a counteroffensive that everyone expected um, didn't really happen. And I think, you know, the Zelensky government made a pretty solid case for that because the, you know, they, they said victory shouldn't, for example, be calculated inch by inch or kilometer by kilometer, especially when all of the aid that Ukraine has been asking for didn't arrive in one batch. It took a long time. And also, you know, their, their Russian side did have time to rebuild, to rebuild their uh, defenses, to put in kilometers and kilometers along the front line of trenches, of minefields and other obstacles for tanks and that sort of thing. Having said all that, I mean, if you look back at uh, last year from where it was and what they've achieved now, basically Ukraine um, with very minimal resources have been, has been able to destroy about 50% 50, 50 of conventional Russia, Russian military capability with about three or 4% of annual US uh, military budget and some assistance from the West. So that's, uh, that's pretty impressive, but um, you know, uh, I, I got to say the tone of that press conference, especially the questions coming from the journalists, really reflects how Ukrainians are feeling right now, asking when is the war going to end? How is it going to end and how long we have to suffer for? A really sobering assessment of the past six months, no doubt. And it's coming as, you know, we heard President Zelensky say he, he is confident that European aid will come. But it's pretty clear that we've got about $100 billion on the line if you combine the 50 or so billion that uh, is for up for grabs now and being debated by the EU and all, obviously the, the $60 billion in the supplemental here in the United States. How much concern is there uh, about the timing? of this, these bills and this funding sure. being agreed to and going to Ukraine? And what are some of the consequences of it not getting there soon enough? Yeah, well, this freeze in funding or blockage, whatever you want to call it, couldn't come at a worse time. I mean, Ukraine really needs that. For example, the $61 billion that has been pledged by the White House uh, goes towards military support, uh, budget support, for example, salaries for teachers and pensions, also uh, humanitarian needs and energy. And Russia has been striking energy infrastructure in Ukraine relentlessly. Um, it's really shocking because politicians, whether here in North America or in Europe, should know better. They should know that if Mr. Putin is not pushed back, and I mean completely back to where he started, that he will make more territorial grabs. He will threaten the EU more. He will weaponize even further migration, energy, and food. And Bianca, these are all things, as you well know, that will have reverberations across the world as they already have higher fuel prices, higher food prices. Can, can Europe even handle more waves of migration should Mr. Putin strike more? So, but you know, this is what we're seeing even, he, even here in Canada, a kind of infiltration of local politics into foreign affairs um, where politicians are being very short-sighted, calculating their chances of being re-elected and not looking at the bigger picture of what will happen if an autocratic dictator like Mr. Putin is allowed to get his way. And Michael, when you think about just the challenges for Ukraine actually going into next year, you think about the infrastructure damage, you think about uh, the death toll, uh, you think about the budget deficit for Ukraine, you think about stalling over mobilization. And, and by the way, war fatigue, as we've touched on around the world. I mean, what is Zelensky's plan for next year? Does he have a concrete plan going into next year as to how to turn things around? Yeah, you know, I got to say that um, for someone who has really uh, transitioned from a TV comic to a wartime president, he's acting very impressively. We could see that at the press conference today. I was listening to it in Ukrainian. Uh, he's projecting confidence, uh, determination, and even hitting back quite forcefully at questions about corruption. But I think 
he has to do this because in all the time I've spent in Ukraine, I've spent most of the war there, um, you, you are realizing now this growing fatigue and weariness. Um, families are being split up. People are no longer having the means to spend the way they could. So he has to do this, number one, to keep the morale up. But, you know, Having said that, I don't know how he's going to get around things. For example, uh, mothers and wives are protesting that um, their their sons, their fathers are spending way too much time at the front lines. They hardly see them anymore. I know there's talk of a mobilization, but um, that could be very expensive. And to <clears throat> directly answer your question, I think um, they are tinkering with, the, for example, the supply chains to make themselves more resilient, more independent of the West, for example, manufacturing uh, more artillery, that sort of thing within Ukraine. But what's really needed um, immediately to just help the Ukrainian population get through this winter, because in fact, an air raid siren just went off where I'm living in Odessa, is that more Patriot missile systems to push back those very, very damaging drones and um, uh, missiles that uh, Russia is sending to Ukraine almost on a daily basis. Michael, for much of the war, I've long argued that Ukraine's best weapon was President Zelensky himself and uh, representing the country, speaking for what the war stands for and what they're fighting for and really resonating in so many capitals and parliaments uh, around the world, especially among Western allies. Uh, here we are now where you see his internal poll numbers uh, are declining. The country is still under martial law, so there's no presidential elections. The only positive headline, as of late at least, has been the accession talk. Uh, yeah. into the EU, but that could take years, and that's much more of a symbolic move. Uh, talk about his stance and, and his position now within the country as the wartime leader. Is there concern that perhaps the the support for him and the popularity yeah. that, that he's, you know, rightly so, amassed over the past two years is really waning and could impact the war? Sure. Well, I haven't met one Ukrainian um, that says it's time for Zelensky to go. They do um, feel more confident with him there. Now, there is talk um, in Ukraine of perhaps having an election, but that would be a tr terrible mistake, actually a tragedy during wartime for a number of reasons. Poll workers couldn't be protected. How are the millions of Ukrainians overseas going to vote? That sort of thing. So I think... Um, <clears throat> unlike in Israel, where the average Israeli is calling for Mr. Netanyahu to go at any second now, <clears throat> I think people are willing to see Mr. Zelensky see the war through. But <clears throat> I think in order for him to do that, he has to tinker a little bit with things. For example, martial law, for example, might be <clears throat> suspended in areas of the country where there isn't active, active fighting. The other thing we're seeing is that, um, you know, if you tune in as a Ukrainian to the press conference, you have to get into this 24-7 so-called TV marathon where all of the main channels have been corralled at the beginning of the war to give a pretty um, <clears throat> pro-presidential, I would say, uh, report of what's going on. And the opposition channels weren't included for this. This has to stop. I think Ukrainians can handle more critical reporting and more free and independent media. And I think that would also help bolster Ukraine's image overseas. So little things he can do there, here and there, but I think... Um, He's there to stay. And one more thing, I have to remind everyone that when he was running for president, he did only he did promise to run only for one term. So if an election were to happen, it could be a farewell for him if he sticks to his pledge. Michael Bosicu, appreciate uh, your analysis. We're so grateful. Thank you so much. We'll be right back with more.